Hello and welcome to NHP's live webinar on safety applications. We'll just give it an extra minute for a few uh, attendees to join in and then we'll get underway. Okay, I think we'll make a start. So again, hello and welcome to NHP's live webinar on safety applications. My name is Daniel Nathanson. I'm a commercial engineer for NHP Electrical Engineering, specializing in automation and integration products and solutions, and also a TUV Rhineland accredited functional safety engineer. This is just one in a series of webinars created to showcase NHP's smart devices powered by smart distribution and embedding smart safety into operational processes providing our customers with better visibility into processes, data, and analytics. In this session, we will specifically be looking at the various techniques for safe stop and motion monitoring in some typical machine safety applications, delve into what each of the safety functions are, and see some examples on how the various safety products are used in combination to achieve safe motion. This session also continues on the series of live and on-demand webinars on other machine safety topics, if you haven't had a chance to view some of these, I would highly recommend you head over to the NHP YouTube channel to view them after this webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to the NHP YouTube channel. So some topics which we will be covering include safe safety functions and monitoring, modes and use, or, sorry, modes of use for machines, standstill detection, safe stop techniques, including safe talk off or STO, stop categories, drive-based safe motion functions and instructions, and some application examples. So please use the chat function to submit any questions and our expert moderators will answer as we go through. Time permitting, we can go through any remaining questions at the conclusion of this webinar. We must always establish the requirements of our safety application by going back to the essentials. Recall our previous Safety Essentials Part 1 session on safety concepts, which if you haven't seen yet, I highly recommend watching after this webinar. First off, identify the hazards associated with the machine. So crushing, cutting, impact, pinch points, etc., or other non-mechanical hazards like noise, heat, and radiation. Perform a risk assessment on the hazards. Take into account the processes and the people involved and determine the residual risk and how best to reduce it. Appoint the safety functions which will be used to reduce the risk. This could be interlocking of guards, speed monitoring, or even requiring a manual reset for the safety control system before restart. Determine the required safety category, performance, or safety integrity level, or SIL, for your safety control system. Use the safety of machinery standards to guide you through the processes and the requirements. Design your safety control system to not only perform the necessary safety functions, but also meet the required safety performance level or integrity. And verify that your safety control system and the parts that you're using meet the requirements for the safety performance level required, and then validate the system to ensure that it works correctly in all expected operations. For example, in normal maintenance and in faulted states. In this session, we're considering the examples of safety functions and their application relating to safe stopping, speed, position, and direction, and how these are incorporated into the safety control system of the machinery. As part of the overall risk reduction strategy, a designer will often choose to achieve some measure of risk reduction through the application of one or more safety functions. These are special functions of the safety control system which are used to maintain safety and which could result in an increased risk if they were to fail. The safety control system which handles the safety functions can consist of a combination of hardware and software and can either be separated from the machine control system or an integral part of it. In addition to providing safety functions, the safety control system can also provide operational functions like um, two-handed control as a means of process initiation or automated locking and unlocking of a guard. The safety function can extend out into the monitoring of the machine to ensure that safe conditions are maintained and any faults or dangerous behavior by the machine is detected and dealt with in a safe manner. 
It is typical to find many machines which are protected by physical guarding that is interlocked to the energy supply of the equipment. This provides very effective protection when the machine operator doesn't require access to the machine while it's powered. This is generally the case for normal operation. However, normal operation is only one of potentially many different modes that a machine can operate in. And so we must ensure that our safeguard measures maintain safety in all modes. A common oversight of many machine safety system designs is the failure to account for all modes of use. A machine can have many modes of usage, including and not limited to normal operation, cleaning, malfunction, commissioning, reconfiguring, maintenance, and many more. There are many examples of the operator requiring access to the equipment whilst it's still running. This may be the case for certain setup, cleaning, or maintenance modes. Traditionally, this could present a high risk situation. If not accounted for in the safety control system design, the machine will not provide a safe way to perform these tasks in a safe manner. In these situations, the operator is often forced to bypass the safety system in an uncontrolled way, and this creates an unsafe situation. We could put in additional safeguards to prevent defeasibility of the interlocking system, which is required by the standards for guard interlocking, but this could still get in the way of the operator easily performing their task. One of the main measures for dealing with defeasibility is to look at the processes involved in using the machine for all modes of use. Identify where a motivation to defeat may occur and remove the motivation. Making the machine easy to use and reducing additional steps which need to be performed to do a task is actually very effective in removing motivation to defeat. So if the operator is able to do their job easily while the safety control system automatically takes care of the rest and doesn't interfere with the job, this is the best outcome. For guard locking applications, we can ensure that the machine has come to standstill or at least a safe speed before allowing access to a guard. So recall from our interlocking devices session that this is called conditional unlocking. It's used in cases where the load may have a long rundown time where simply opening the guard and removing power um, won't leave enough time for the hazard to clear quick enough. The safety function in this case is to initiate a safe stop and measure the speed of the machine to reliably ensure that we reach standstill before allowing access. Speed is measured by direct means like proximity sensors or encoders um, or indirect means like back EMF monitoring. We also saw examples of these in our safety monitoring relay session. This method of standstill detection is primarily focused around removing power from the load in order to ensure that the machine is safe, which is the default safe state for machinery. It typically does this by removing electrical power from the load via contactors or removing torque power from the motor by disabling the gating circuit from the variable speed drive. The latter function is called safe torque off or STO and is a standardized safety function for safety rated variable speed drives. Safe torque off or just STO is the most common and most basic drive based safety function. It's performed by removing power to the gating circuit for high speed switching components of the output. They're called IGBTs. This prevents the outputs from producing the pulsed output, which provides torque to the motor, hence the term safe torque off. Also, as it only removes torque, it doesn't remove the voltage from the motor terminal, so it can't be used for isolation purposes alone. If it's triggered in the middle of operation, the motor will decelerate in an uncontrolled manner, which is why this function is generally used in conjunction with other safety functions. Hence, it is considered a safety sub function. This type of uncontrolled stop is uh, also called a category zero stop as defined in AS4024 part 1204, which permits it to be used in emergency stop applications in accordance with this standard. As torque power is completely removed, external forces may still act upon the load to move it. So for example, in hoisting applications, if power were removed, a suspended load could fall dangerously. Additional measures like mechanical braking may be necessary to, pre to prevent further hazards. So if an external force effect is to be anticipated, additional measures should be provided to safely prevent any potential movement. As I mentioned earlier, when STO is initiated, the motor will simply coast to a stop. This may not be the best course of action, particularly if the machine has high inertia um, and takes a long time to slow down, or it could cause another hazard if stopped in the middle of a process. In many applications, motors cannot simply be isolated and left to coast to stop, as this could cause an, an, uh, sorry, an intolerable risk. 
An uncontrolled rundown of this type often takes considerably longer than controlled braking or deceleration. So what we can do instead is to initiate a controlled stop by ramping down the motor or initiate a braking function before completely removing power. Only when the motor is at standstill or has reached a safe speed, the STO function is triggered and power is removed. This is called the safe stop one function or SS1. This function also corresponds to what's called a category one stop as defined in AS4025 part 1204 and can be used for an emergency stop in accordance with this standard. SS1 monitors the, de the deceleration rate of the load. So once the set ramp down has run its course, the driver is then shut down safely. The reaction times are reduced compared to allowing the motor to coast down. As a result, in many cases, the safety distances to the hazard can also be reduced. This provides a number of benefits, such as improved ergonomics for the plant operator, space saving due to the reduced distance between the guards and the hazard, and of course, cost savings. So both STO and SS1, however, do not prevent the load from moving once it has come to standstill, as power has been removed. This is where more advanced techniques are required and can only be provided by power drive systems like variable speed drives. A safe operated stop or SOS is another defined subfunction, which continues to monitor the position of the motor or load when it's in the stop position. It does this to ensure that the motor does not move by an unsafe amount whilst it's supposed to be at standstill. SOS is an alternative to STO, but unlike STO, the motor doesn't need to completely stop exerting torque. Instead, the drive remains in position, holds its position, and is monitored in a closed control loop. SOS can also be used to aid in production so as to keep the machine in a fixed standby state, which enables it to be immediately restarted once the safety function has been lifted. This is so that the machine processes can be continued with little loss of production. Um, like STO, however, SOS is intended to be used in combination with other safe stop functions. Safe stop 2 or SS2 is another safe stop function which initiates a controlled stop much like SS1. However, while SS1 initiates an STO at the end of the ramp down, SS2 instead issues an SOS command once the standstill has been reached. This function also corresponds to what's called a category 2 stop as defined in AS4024, however, cannot be used for emergency stop in accordance with this standard. This is because emergency stop requires complete removal of power to the machine, which SS2 does not offer. Rather, it should be used for other non-emergency modes of the machine. Modern safety systems allow us to do more than just turn off the machine and remain at standstill to reduce the risk of injury to the operator. In fact, the standard AS4024 part 1204 recommends implementing techniques such as safe speed and position monitoring for tasks which require the equipment to be operational during access. Safe speed and position monitoring, or just safe motion, allows the equipment to be operational while allowing access to the equipment. The risk is reduced because the machine will operate at a reduced speed. The safety function will monitor the speed and ensure that the safe speed is maintained. Additional safety functions, such as using hold to run devices or implementing jog operations can be considered to further reduce the risk. Safe motion techniques like safe speed monitoring reduce risks associated with setup and maintenance in two ways. They provide a safer way to perform the task because the slower moving equipment presents a reduced risk and the safety system allows the access required by the operator. So this reduces the motivation of the operator to dangerously bypass the safety system. Remember, this was the removing of the motivation to defeat. So probably one of the best ways to do it is let the operator do their job. Safe motion functionality is another example of how modern machine safety systems are providing a more complete risk reduction by allowing high levels of productivity to be maintained. So let's have a look at some of these safe motion functions. Safely limited speed or SLS is used to monitor the speed of the motor to ensure that it uh, that it does not go above a predefined safe speed. It's most like it's uh, mostly used in applications which require access to a guarded area by an operator, and in order to keep the risk at a minimal, the machine must remain at a slow speed. If the SLS function detects that the safe limit has been violated, the safety control system must initiate a safe stop function. This can be done using STO for an uncontrolled category zero stop, as shown here or SS1 for a controlled category one stop. Ensuring that the speed remains as low as possible provides the best chance for the operator to react quickly in the event of an error. 
Um, also, the slow speed ensures that when the safe stop function is initiated, the machine comes to standstill much earlier than if it was running at full speed. Aside from monitoring its speed, the risk of the machine could be reduced by ensuring that it remains in a safe position during certain modes of operation. Safe Limited Position Monitoring, or SLP, ensures that the load does not move outside preset position limits. If the limit is exceeded, the motor is braked using a safe stop function. The monitoring of the load position must be done using absolute position detection, which is directly coupled to the load. This is best done using encoders, which can also provide the speed feedback for other safe motion functions. And we'll have a look at an example of it later. In this example shown, we have a goods lift, which can move between two floors. The machine will remain in operation whilst the lift platform is between or level with either floor. Um, beneath the platform may be a crushing hazard if the platform goes too far down. So SLP monitoring is enforced so that if the platform exceeds these limits, the motors must come to a stop to prevent it moving any further. The direction of the load may also be monitored for safe operation. This is called safe direction, uh, the safe direction function or SDI, which monitors the load to ensure that it's not moving in an invalid or otherwise unsafe direction. SDI is used in applications where certain hazards only exist whilst the machine is moving in an unsafe direction. In the example shown, the hazard is that a person could be drawn into the machine between two rollers, but it's only present if the rollers are moving in a particular direction. If the operator needs to perform a task near this hazard, they must be assured that the rollers are moving so that they push against their hand instead of drawing it in, which could occur if they were moving in the opposite direction. SDI is frequently used in combination with SLS, where the operator requires access to the machine to perform a task. If the machine is, is moving slowly to begin with, um, the time taken to safely stop the machine is reduced and then the risk is minimized. All safe motion functions require feedback from the load, which provides it with its speed, position, um, and or direction. But we cannot just take any feedback from the machine process and trust that it is safe, as there may be issues relating to the scaling of the speed and position that may not otherwise be detected. Accuracy and reliability is key in safe motion functions, so a special safety function is required to ensure that the feedback from the machine is reliable for the other safe motion functions to utilize. In safety PLCs, this is realized as the Safety Feedback Interface Instruction, or SFX. Whilst SFX is technically a safety instruction within the PLC, it alone does not perform a safety function. Therefore, it is required to be used in conjunction with other safe motion functions or instructions, as we just saw, um, including SLS, SLP, and SDI. Contrarywise, these safe motion instructions require the SFX instruction in order to provide the safe speed, position, and direction reference for the instructions to operate in the first place. So they come in pairs. You use an SLS or an SLP, you have to have an SFX instruction ahead of it. So traditionally, the SFX would take its physical input from a safety enabled driver and axis, which contains within it information on the velocity and the position of the connected load. This could be via embedded or external encoders and then translates this into usable tags for the safety PLC. Now, however, with the, sorry, now, however, with the advent of dedicated independent safety encoders, this external feedback can be provided directly into the SFX instruction without requiring any intermediate drives or devices. So we should now know a bit more about the various different safe stop and safe motion functions and instructions. Let's put them into practice with an application example using off the shelf products. In this example, we performed a risk assessment and we've defined some of the modes of use for our machine and the risks associated with them. Normal mode, maintenance mode, and a third emergency mode. Per our risk assessment, the hazardous motion of the machine during normal mode presents an intolerable risk. So access to the machine is restricted by a movable safeguard, which is being monitored and locked shut. If we can slow the machine down to a, sl to a slow speed, we can reduce the amount of risk associated with this hazard but we don't want to keep the machine running at a slow rate if we don't have to, as this will impact production. So we only really need to slow the machine down if the required access to it is to perform maintenance. This will allow us to keep the machine running while we have access through the guards. However, if a fault occurs in the safety control system, um, such as if the machine were to suddenly speed up while the guarding is unlocked, 
then we need to initiate an emergency stop and remove power to the machine as quickly as possible. So what equipment can we use to achieve this? Let's have a look at a hardwired safety control system. Firstly, our application requires us to have some control over the speed of the machine. A variable speed drive will come in handy for this application as we can set up multiple speeds for normal and maintenance mode among others, and then switch between them. Also, as we need to remove power after performing an emergency stop, something which can be performed by a safe talk off function should be selected. In this case, we've selected a PowerFlex 525, which is appropriate for the motor. We also require some safety logic, which can perform the safety functions we need, as well as provide some fault monitoring and diagnostics, as we identified by our risk assessment. The logic component should also be capable of performing the SLS and safe stop functions as required. We've identified a specialized safety monitoring relay, which can perform these tasks, namely the Guardmaster Safety Relay Model GLP. It also uses proximity sensors to provide the speed feedback. We also require some proximity sensors, which are compatible with the safety monitoring relay and which can perform the load, so which can monitor the load directly. These don't need to be anything special, provided that they have a fast enough switching frequency and sufficient sensing distance and have a three wire PNP output, uh, which is compatible with the GLP relay. As our guard needs to be monitored and locked during hazardous motion, we also require a guard interlock switch. We require this to be a power to unlock as we don't want our guard to automatically unlock due to a severed cable or a power loss. So we've selected a 440 GLZ series guard interlock switch in this instance. And we also require some operator interface in order to provide some uh, unlock and lock and reset commands. A pair of push buttons should suffice. And these are also required by the safety monitoring relay to perform its functions. We wire it all up. Let's take a closer look at how this is supposed to function and how it performs the required tasks for the different modes. We have our GLP safety monitoring relay set up to SLS logic mode whereby it determines the speed of the proximity sensors, ensuring that if it's less than the SLS1 setting, and if the speed of the machine exceeds SLS1, then the safety monitoring relay will turn off its uh, safety outputs. In normal operation mode, we press the gate lock reset request push button to reset the safety control system. The guard should be closed and locked at this point, and the safety monitoring relay verifies this. If the guard is locked, is closed and locked, then it turns on its outputs, which enable the gating circuit to the drive. The drive can now be provided with normal start-stop commands as required. To initiate maintenance mode, we begin by pressing the gate unlock request button. The safety monitoring relay uh, responds by energizing its output, Y32, which is wired to a preset frequency input on the drive. The drive is then commanded to run at this preset frequency and the machine begins to ramp down to a slower speed. The proximity sensors monitor the speed. Once it's reached below the SLS setting threshold, an unlock signal is then sent on terminal 51 of the safety monitoring relay to the guard interlock switch. On receipt of this unlock signal, the guard interlock switch solenoid is energized and the guard is now unlocked. Access is now permitted through the guard while the machine is operating at the reduced speed. The safety monitoring relay continues to monitor the status of the guard and speed of the machine via the proxy sensors. Um, so if the speed exceeds SLS while the guard is opened or unlocked, then it will immediately remove power from its uh, output terminals, which in turn remove power from the drive gate control circuit and then force an STO function. Torque from the drive to the motor is now removed and the motor goes to a stop. This was a fairly basic solution using traditional hardwired components. Um, let's have a look at the same application example, but this time let's look at using an alternative solution using the safe networked components and a safety PLC. In this case, we still want to use a variable speed drive, but rather than using hardwired inputs for standard and safe control, let's choose something which can perform safety functions over the comms network. In this case, we're using a SIP safety over ethernet and the drive in question can perform the STO function by sending a command to it over the network. This simplifies the wiring as the only control IO is literally an ethernet cable. We've gone with the PowerFlex 527 this time as it supports SIP safety over ethernet. For our logic, we've decided to use a safety PLC, specifically the GuardLogic's uh, 5580 series. The processor also natively supports SIP safety over ethernet via its embedded ethernet port. Um, if in our risk assessment, we determine that we require performance level E or SIL3, 
then we also use the safety partner module. For speed feedback, we're going for a new safety encoder, which, incorp which uh, communicates velocity and position safely over Ethernet. The only wiring in this case is power supply and an Ethernet cable. The 843ES series SIP safety encoder is perfect for this job. For our guard interlock, we also have an option for a, SIP, for a SIP safety enabled device, namely the 442G MAB or the multifunction access box, which provides us with the SIP safety over Ethernet interface, as opposed to the traditional hardwired option. This also doubles as a local control station and provides several push buttons, which we can use for our unlock and lock reset commands. Again, wiring is simplified as we only have two cables, power and Ethernet. And to tie it all together, we choose a layer three ethernet switch to handle the ethernet communication between the devices. This doesn't necessarily need to be a special SIP safety managed switch or anything special for that matter. The SIP safety protocol is handled by the end devices and doesn't rely on any intermediate hardware or media to be safety rated for this purpose. Our wiring diagram in this case is tremendously simplified. All we need to interconnect everything is an ethernet cable. All of the logic and connections are performed inside the safety PLC. So if we were building multiples of these machines, we only need to write the program once. The folks doing the hardware installation only need to run the power and network cabling. So potential wiring faults are effectively removed. Inside the safety PLC is where all the magic happens, to, so to speak. The guard logic safety PLC is programmed inside Studio 5000 Logics Designer, which is the, um, which is the one application to configure, program, and maintain the entire Allen Bradley Logics 5000 family of controller products and related devices. All of the main components which perform our safety functions communicate via Ethernet IP and have special add-on profiles for logics. These are simply added to our project tree and can now access predefined tags for these devices very easily. This is a very high level overview of the program, which in reality requires a bit more work, but for the purposes of this webinar should at least help illustrate what the logic is doing. The first item is our 843ES SIP safety encoder, which provides feedback position and velocity directly into our SFX instruction. Now, this is where we specify the position scaling, feedback resolution, etc. The data output of the SFX, SFX instruction is then used as inputs to the SLS instruction where we perform our safe speed monitoring. However, we need to be able to tell our SLS instruction when it should begin monitoring. If it was enabled whilst the machine was running at full speed in normal mode, then it would trip every single time. So we can use a signal from the PowerFlex 527 drive to advise the SLS instruction when it should begin monitoring. In the SLS instruction, we also provide a check delay which delays the monitoring for a short time after the drive has allowed the machine to slow down um, to ensure there's no funny business going before unlocking the guard. After the check delay, the SLS instruction output tags, uh, outputs a tag rather called SLS active. This tells us that it's currently monitoring the speed of the machine from the encoder and that it is below the set limit. The MAB interlock switch also provides us with a series of push buttons which we assign one of them as our unlock request operator. When we push this button, we send the signal to the drive to reduce its speed. However, the guard remains locked until the SLS instruction gives us the okay. We use another pre-certified safety instruction, which monitors the status of the door via the MAB guard interlock. This is the dual channel input stop with test and lock or DCSTL. This safety instruction also controls the unlock command to the MAB which is only provided if the SLS active tag from the SLS instruction is active, naturally. As the speed is okay, the DCSTL instruction then sends an unlock request to the MAB guard interlock, which allows us to open the guard while the machine is at a safe speed. If, however, the SLS instruction um, detects a speed above the set limit, it drops its output and then notifies us that the limit has been reached or exceeded. We can then use the output of this instruction to send a safe talk off command to our PowerFlex 527 over Ethernet to initiate a category zero stop. We can also issue the STO command if any faults are detected in any of the program or the hardware fault tags. Now, as I mentioned that this is not the complete code, we still require the rest of the lock reset, interlocking and fault handling and diagnostic logic. So 
For the sake of brevity, I've not shown this, but this should be enough to at least illustrate the flow of logic with respect to how the safety functions should operate. But regardless, let's have a look at our now safety system uh, in action. So just like the hardwired solution, the actions of the operator are seamless. All they need to do is press the yellow unlock request button and the machine automatically slows down to the safe speed. The MAB unlocks and the operator can now open the guard and perform their tasks on the machine in the safeguarded area. Meanwhile, the safety control system carefully monitors the machine's speed and ensures that it does not go higher than the safe limits. Once the operator has finished their task, they simply just need to exit, close the guard behind them and then press the blue lock reset button. The machine then registers that the guard is closed and locked and then resumes normal operational speed. As the operator barely needs to interact with the safety control system in order to perform their duties bar pressing a couple of push buttons, there is little motivation to try and to defeat the safety control system as it completely allows them to do their job without interfering or getting in the way. And so concludes today's presentation on safety applications. By now, you should have some more intimate knowledge on the various techniques for safe stop and motion monitoring in some typical machine safety applications, understand what each of the safety functions are, and have an appreciation on how the various safety products are used in combination to achieve these safety functions. For some more in-depth examples on these safety applications, head over to Rockwell Automation's webpage on safety function documents. Here you'll find a wide variety of application technique documents, which include information on setup and wiring, bill of materials, configuration, verification and validation plans, and the calculation of performance level. For more information on the selection or even just on machine safety in general, there's a wealth of information available in the NHP machine safety selection guide. And always, I also highly recommend reading through the Rockwell Automation Machinery Safebook 5 which is a bit more advanced, but provides fantastic guidance around getting around designing and navigating machine safety control systems. I'm now able to answer any questions that you may have uh, sent during the presentation that haven't already been answered by our expert moderators. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, great presentation. Um, it was easy to follow and understand through your visual image representations on both application and wiring examples. Um, so my name's Jack Wheatley uh, and I'm the product manager for safety sensing and signaling at NHP um, and as mentioned by Dan we'll take this time uh, to go through some questions that haven't been answered yet in our chat um, so if you do have any feel free to put some in um, and if we don't have time to go through them with Dan we'll um, we'll definitely reach out uh, individually to answer and um, and go from there um, so we've got one here Dan that says can I get a proxy sensor option into a safety PLC or do I have to use the safety relay um, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, um, so the guard logics or, or the safety PLC instructions themselves don't accommodate um, proximity sensors as the safety device. Um, so you do need to use the GLP. However, what you can do is the, the GLP, um, which, which is the safety relay that takes in the proxies, it has a special mode called uh, speed monitoring only. So what you can do is you can take a couple of outputs from the GLP and you can feed that directly into the safety PLC as an input device. So effectively what happens is um, you still set all of your speed settings on the GLP um, while the machine, sorry, while, yeah, while the, the speed is above the set limit, um, those input uh, contacts are off effectively. And then once the machine slows down to the safe speed and then they turn on and then that tells the, sa tells the safety PLC that the machine is at the safe speed and then do what else, uh, do everything else that you need to do. Um, so it's a little bit more involved than just using the encoder. Um, this is where the uh, the new SIP safety encoder is probably a, a good option in this case because it, it's a direct uh, input device into the safety PLC. But if you want to use proximity sensors, you can. You just need to use that GLP relay um, in between them. Cool, cool. Thanks for that. Um, so I've got another one here um, that asks, do those safe direction and position functions actually keep the motor uh, in the right range? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, technically speaking, no. Um, so the, the purpose of those safety uh, instructions is to just monitor to make sure that everything is in, is in the right place and in the right direction as it should be. Um, but what happens is if the direction, if, we, if we're doing safe direction, if the direction goes in the, in, in the incorrect range, then what happens is um, that instruction then sends a safe stop command to the output device or to the drive. Um, so it doesn't necessarily keep the machine from going into the wrong 
ranges or in the wrong positions. It's only there to ensure that if it does go into the wrong place, then it just shuts everything down. Um, so this is only during under fault conditions when the machine will not be in the correct position or in the right direction. Um, but if shutting down the machine completely may cause um, an additional hazard, like uh, say for example, in, in hoisting applications, um, if you were to just all of a sudden cut power to the to the motors, the um, the, 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 the the hoist or the lift could completely drop the load. Um, so what you can do is you can take the output of the safety instruction for the safe position or the safe speed or whatever, and you can use that to draw to drive um, safety brakes, for example, or some other measures which prevent uh, any further hazards from occurring. That's a really good question, actually. Um, that, that's actually a common misconception with a lot of these safety instructions is um, they don't necessarily uh, keep the machine in the safe position or safe speed. It's, it's only there to monitor those conditions. And only if those conditions go into a unsafe state, then it initiates a safe stop. Yeah, thanks for that. A really good detailed uh, answer there. Um, and thanks for the question too, by the way. Um, so the next one we've got here in our list um, is asking, what's the difference between a stop category and a safety category? <laughs> I um, I was expecting this question to come up. Um, that's a, um, it, it does cause a little bit of confusion in the, in the safety standards when you are still talking about categories and then meaning completely different things. So um, a stop category is um, is defined as, but basically the, the nature in how the machine is brought to us to a stop or to standstill. So there's three stop categories. There's zero, one, and two, um, which I, I did discuss in, in, in the presentation. So a stop category zero is when you just remove power and the thing just slows down uncontrollably. Uh, stop category one is when you, you decelerate the load in a controlled manner and then you remove power. And then category stop category two is when you um, bring the machine down to a standstill in a controlled manner, but you don't remove power after the fact. Um, so you can't use stop category two for an emergency stop situation, but you can for stop category zero and one. When we're talking about safety categories, that's something that's a little bit overarching. So when we're talking about a safety category, uh, we're talking about the um, the performance or the integrity of the entire safety control system. Um, and what it does is it gauges uh, how much risk is reduced. So for very low risk applications, you'll be using maybe a safety category B or one. And then for very high risk applications, you'll be using safety category three or four. Um, the higher the number effectively, the, um, the more risk is reduced from your application. It, it is a little bit tricky with the wording and the way the standards have presented it, um, but we just need to be conscious of a stop category and safety category as being completely different things. So it's always good to prefix when you're talking about categories, if you're talking about stop or if you're talking about safe. Cool. No, thanks for that, Dan. And uh, a really well um, structured answer. And, and I'd recommend to the person you know, who's asked that uh, if they do have any follow up to um, reach out and uh, we're happy to help categorize for them if they are having any issues. Uh, on site. Um, so the next question we've got here uh, is asking uh, from Dennis, can SIP safety over Ethernet be implemented to achieve SIL3 safety functions? Yes, it can. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's an easy one. Um, yeah, so so SIP safety over Ethernet is is good for um, cat up to category up to safety category four. I should put that prefix in there. So it's good for up to safety category four, um, performance level E, and up to SIL three for the machine safety world, definitely. Um, so the thing with SIP safety over Ethernet is um, all of the certification and the, and the safety rated um, side of things is actually done on the end devices. So if we're talking about communication between a safety PLC and maybe um, a distributed IO block, um, both of those devices, their, their Ethernet components are individually assessed under the SIP safety protocol. So they, they are safety rated Ethernet interfaces. Everything that happens between those interfaces, it doesn't actually matter. It can be standard Ethernet cabling, it can be a standard uh, network switch, it can be Wi-Fi if, if you really, really wanted to. All of the safety is taken care of by the protocol itself. So the information that gets sent along this mysterious wire called Ethernet is, is actually the safety factor. But now that's a that's a that's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> nice, and thanks thanks for answering. Um, so we've got another one here. Um, that asks, 
does the network switch used in, in your example uh, need to be dedicated to that particular safety function or can it be used for other tasks on site? No, not at all. So um, th that's the beauty of, si of SIP safety over Ethernet is that any of the intermediate devices, as I said, they don't need to be special purpose or, or special colored cables or anything like that. Um, it, it would make things a little bit easier from a maintenance perspective to have dedicated hardware. So maybe having a, a switch or, or a router dedicated for the safety function, but by no means is it necessary. Um, you might maybe want to document, you know, which ports on the on the router the, or on the switch that you're using for safety related uh, applications. Um, but no, you, you can use that switch for safety, for non-safety. Um, you could even use it for the enterprise level stuff if you really wanted to. Um, it's it's completely open. As I said, all, all of the safety uh, implementation is done only in the information that gets transferred. So the hardware is irrelevant when we're talking about the networking side. Cool, cool. Yeah, definitely the way to go. Um, so we've got another one here um, which asks, uh, actually it's just been answered, but it asks, would adding a single safety contactor to a, to a STO CAT3 rated driver allow the application to achieve CAT4 rating? Um, and Vincent has asked, has answered with two contactors would be required as per the as per response above. So I don't know if you have any further comments on that, Dan. Or yeah, yeah, I do actually. So that that's a common um, question that comes up with drives and using Safe Talk off. Um, so <clears throat> the problem is when we start dealing with safety categories, and then we also have safety performance levels and SIL. So the requirements between the two different standards that you're using um, can make a fair bit of difference in the architecture. So when we're, if, if you are dealing with safety categories alone, that's when you need to start putting in these additional measures like redundant contactors. So what you would typically need to do is um, if you're wanting to use a drive with Safe Talk Off, the drive will have already been independently um, certified by say TV Rhineland or or, uh, or Simtars or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and they will have assigned a safety category or performance level to the drive, to the STO function itself. Now, what you'll typically find is that with drives, they, they're usually given a category three rating, safety category three. So if you're designing around safety categories only and you need a safety category four system, that drive by itself is not enough. In fact, you can't even just add one additional contact and call it a day. You need to actually put in two safety contactors in line with the drive. Um, effectively, you're ignoring the drive uh, safety capabilities altogether. Um, but what you'll actually find though is that a lot of these drives, which are um, category three, um, they're also certified for performance level E. Um, and that's the beauty of performance level is that the architecture is, is a lot more fluid. You're a lot more uh, open to, to different um, archetypes effectively. So if the, the, the drive is PLE, performance level E, then you don't need any contactors. Um, but the because the drive itself has already been certified for the for the highest level of uh, of, of performance for of safety performance, um, so it, it does pay to I guess pay attention to which standard you're 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 using, um, and it is a good uh, I suppose a good reminder to consider the performance level standards um, because they can allow a lot of these additional sh uh, sort of shortcuts um, through designing your safety control system. Um, without removing any any necessarily removing any safety integrity. Um, yeah. So yeah, for, cat, for category four, yeah, you'll need two contactors unless the drive itself is rated as category four itself. Cool, thanks for that. So for, we've probably got a couple, only a couple more minutes. So we might um, just review, there's a couple of questions that have come through on encoders. So we might just review one that's already been answered just to see if you've got any further comments on it. So someone's asked, um, do you have to use a safety PLC when use to use an encoder? Um, and Vince did answer with a, a simple answer being yes, um, but for category three and four situations, um, it will be required to use a safety PLC. So this is because the input logic and output components all must be safety rated uh, to that required category. Um, so I guess, do you have any more comments to uh, to add to Vince's answer? Vincent's answer? Um, not really. Um, so if you're using a uh, an encoder for safety purposes, um, yeah, if it's if it's a safety encoder like the like the SIP safety one we're talking about, then yeah, it, it needs to be used with a safety PLC. Um, but if you're you, if you want to use perhaps maybe standard encoders, um, there are safety monitoring relays available which can utilize safety encoders, um, but they they're not necessarily going to interface with the PLC side of things. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it really depends on what sort of category or performance level you're dealing with as to what equipment is is required. Um, you'll also find that with standard encoders, you may require two 
um, in order to satisfy the redundancy requirements of categories three and four. Um, and, or, and the other thing as well is that those two standard encoders need to be of different types. So one of them needs to will uh, could potentially be an incremental encoder, and the other one would be a uh, maybe a sign cos type encoder. So then you need to take care of the uh, the diversity factor at the same time. Um, so the, the the idea of us bringing out this new SIP safety encoder actually simplifies things quite considerably because you can use that single safety encoder. Um, uh, almost as a single channel architecture and achieve um, PLE in SIL3. The safety category thing on the other side, that will require some fault exclusions because um, obviously the, the encoder is only monitoring one mechanical aspect. Um, so you'll need to um, ensure that everything is adequately oversized. Yep, yep, very good point. So I think that's about all, time, all the time we have um, for today. Um, but if there is any more questions from anyone on the line, um, please feel free free to reach out to NHP um, via your local sales rep or via our customer care service centre or via Dan directly, um, which his details are on the uh, on, on the uh, page as well as in the chat. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for your time. Have you got anything you'd like to add, Dan? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, just to close things off, thanks. Thank you very much, Jack, for, for moderating. Um, and also thank you to Vincent as well for moderating. So um, to everyone who's joined, thank you for joining us on this webinar. Um, I hope you found it beneficial. And if you'd like to watch it again, a recording will be uploaded to the NHP YouTube channel shortly. Um, to find more webinars in the series, um, you can go to nhp.com.au or our dedicated NHP YouTube channel. And as Jack said, if you have any further questions about machine safety products and solutions, um, please contact your local NHP sales representative or you can flick me an email. Um, and having said that, with uh, smarter and faster decision making and seamless connectivity, spurring new collaboration, NHP is enabling the connected enterprise. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.